Would anybody feel comfortable sharing something that they have perhaps felt shameful about in the past that has been eroded? Again, it doesn't have to be like that snap gone away moment. Stella, you have your, your hand raised, please. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of my personal story would add to what I was thinking uh, when Lola was talking is, I mean, the what, number one tool for combating shame is bringing things out of the darkness, talking about it. So like Lola was saying, like somebody sharing a story with her about their thing and her being able to like validate it and reflect back, like that's normal, that's great. Everyone wants to hear that they're normal and okay. And, um, you know, I actually give Mystery Box Show as homework to a lot of my clients because hearing people talk about this is so powerful in combating shame and people hearing their own stories reflected. Um, and the thing for me that was huge, you know, around, you know, body shame was again, show the thing that you feel uncomfortable about. I just started getting naked a lot more. Um, you know, in college, I was invited to um, these like naked co-ed, you know, hot tubbing places. Up in Portland, I started doing nude modeling. Um, and that was huge for me and just sort of putting it in someone else's hands. Like, okay, well, the photographer wants to put it <laughs> out there. And so that's letting them validate that or letting the audience validate that. Um, and then the storytelling piece, you know, getting on stage for Mystery Box has, it's not therapy, but it has felt therapeutic because I get up there and say my stuff that I feel shame about or embarrassed about and then you know, the audience hoot and hollers about it and cries about it and hugs you later. Um, and I think that's how we can all move through it together. I 100% agree, especially about the, the storytelling piece. And we've seen that happen over and over with people who who, who have heard stories and said, you know, like I, I, I thought I was so strange or so unique. Uh, and then hearing somebody talk about basically me up on stage uh, showed me that, oh, that, that I am not. Um, and, I, and, and I think that goes a lot towards feeling um, feeling not alone. But mm -hmm. Matthew, I, I remember something you and I were talking about with shame once, and I, this might even been in the story you told earlier this year uh, about, I think it was Brene Brown's difference between guilt and shame. Um, it, yeah, I always like, my quick definition is uh, guilt is I've done something bad. Shame is I am bad, right? Like shame is usually this global sense of wrongness. And I think Dirty uh, Lola said it beautifully. Um, culturally, we often define sex as appropriate or not appropriate or acceptable versus unacceptable. And that's not only this kind of uh, binary thinking, this black and white thinking, but either you're doing it right or it's totally wrong. And that's completely shameful uh, versus, ooh, that didn't work for me. How do I get curious around that and have it work for me? And so I always think moving from acceptable to unacceptable to is it consensual and is it pleasurable? I think those are great standards to use. And can I, can I ask is, I wonder if there's anything involved with sort of the receivership. Do you find that people often get over shame by themselves individually, or does it often take people around them? I think um, kind of again with that Benet Brown idea that vulnerability is kind of the antidote to shame, right? And Stella said it beautifully with, when we talk about it, we live in a culture that tells us we have to be super sexy, but don't you dare talk about it, right? Like if you talk about it, it somehow takes the magic of sex or the sexy out of it. And so I have a lot of clients that want something, but they don't want to have to describe it or ask for it because that somehow takes the mystique away. And yeah, so I find when people start talking about it and they're vulnerable, most often someone will be like, oh my God, yes, that is exactly what happened to me. Or, oh my gosh, that is so awkward for me too. Um, I always joke Americans were taught to be super sexy, but we don't, um, or we're taught to be sexy, don't actually talk about it. And that's why so many Americans, their first sexual experiences are super awkward and usually not um, really that great. That makes me think that Reba, you might have something to contribute there if I can, <laughs> if I can raise your hand for you. Right, because I, uh, so I grew up in a military family and so my early childhood was in, uh, in, uh, Kaiserslautern uh, Rammstein, on Rammstein Air Force Base in Germany, uh, which is very just sexually open and um, 
I don't want to necessarily credit my parents. <laughs> uh, my parents were very neutral around it, I guess. They never said like, yes, do the sex or no, don't do the sex. It was just very neutral. But my surroundings, my peers, my teachers, even I give this ex example, the German version of Sesame Street. Well, it was Sesame Street itself, but there was a, a different opening. The opening credits were different. And it was uh, little naked children running around a fountain. Um, where in like America, you would not see naked children <laughs> on TV at all. That would be like criminal. Um, or, you know, if we went to like a public swimming pool, it was always clothing optional. Like that was the default. Um, if you went to a pool where you had to wear a swimsuit, that was abnormal. And so that just sort of was ingrained in me of like, that's just how it is. And that probably has a lot to do with uh, me being open. Uh, but with that being said, that's not like a, a cure all or anything like that. What I was going to say prior to that, Eric, is that I do remember a specific like shameful time in my early 20s um, where I was still figuring out who I was sexually. Um, I know now that I identify as a kinky person and I didn't know that that's really what that was back then. Um, and I wasn't even doing so I was with a partner. Um, and I was just doing something silly. I call it, I'll call it like acrobatic, if you will. Um, I think I was lying on my back, but I was kind of like my head was off the bed and I was almost probably, I was probably touching the ground, the floor actually with my hands. I was just in a contort, I was like a contortionist. Um, and I was like this, this is hot to me. Like, let's have sex this way. And my partner just like looked at me and said, uh, that's weird. And that just put a kibosh on the whole thing. And I was like, oh, I, he said, that's weird. But I translated that to I'm weird. Um, and so sex wasn't that great after that because I was too scared to ask for anything or suggest anything ever again. And so I know we've talked here about um, talking about our interests and having people validate them, like an audience can validate you, your therapist can validate you, et cetera. But I also want to, um, I don't know, not discount that our partners can help you erase that shame as well, because, um, you know, it was through having partners after that who were open to sort of kinky things or who were kinky themselves or who, um, maybe ask for something that I wasn't into. And then that challenged me to ask myself, well, is that something they should be ashamed of just because I don't like it? Um, obviously the answer is no, but it gave me the opportunity to sort of ask myself those questions. Um, and I think eventually I just, having great partners who have open communication, I think really helps.